Hi, this is Robbie McKenzie. Thanks so much for joining in on another episode of Youth Ministry 6.3. Uh, looking for a little help, uh, help in uh, a lot of different areas. Uh, but if you'd like to help out with this and uh, help me in, in doing this, I would look, love for you to, to join me in this conversation. I'm looking for some graphic design help, maybe help design a logo for Youth Ministry 6.3 and maybe a little website help. Uh, looking also for for ideas at uh, interviewing and uh, maybe organizing a little bit better and just all around. So if you'd like to, to help, uh, just shoot me an email, remckenzie11 at hotmail.com uh, or comment on the video or whatever. Uh, next guest is John Stackhouse Jr. Uh, you're going to get a lot out of him. It's a really, really thick interview. I enjoyed it tremendously. John, uh, such a good man and I appreciated uh, him so much. Uh, and so, thanks again for joining in on the conversation, and uh, another episode, Youth Ministry 6.3. Thank you so much. This is Robbie McKenzie, Youth Ministry 6.3. I am with the one and only John Stackhouse, Jr. Uh, mm-hmm. he, Dr. Stackhouse has agreed to interview with me. He is a professor of theology at Regent College there in, I believe, Vancouver, B.C., That's uh, right. Canada, and uh, and John has written a, a, a number of books, um, but, but the one we're interested in is this one right here, uh, Making the Best of It. Um, I thought when I was reading it, uh, Dr. Stackhouse, I thought there was so much relevance there, not only to youth ministry, but, but really to, to churches and Christians in general. And so uh, thank you so much for agreeing to, to interview with me. I, I appreciate you so much. You bet. Thank you. Uh, just first question. Uh, when you you know the overall thrust of the book, what what is it? Uh, why did you write the book? What does it seek to accomplish? And those things. So my interest in writing the book, Robbie, was to offer what we sometimes call a social ethics, or even just a fundamental ethics. Now, ethics usually is understood nowadays as just morality. You know, right, right and wrong. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Right. And that's part of it. But what I should and shouldn't do ought to emerge from who I am and what I'm for, what I'm supposed to be in the world. And so a fundamental ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, Mm -hmm. which just means the character of something or the nature of something. And so this book looks at what God made Christians to be and to do, but even more fundamentally, it, it goes back to look at what God made human beings to be and to do. One of the things I found as somebody who was raised in the church myself is that I was always talked to as if I were a Christian Mm-hmm. And yet, I'm actually fundamentally a human being. Sure. At the beginning of the Bible, there aren't any Christians. You actually have to read quite a bit of the Bible to find any Christians. You have to read through the whole Old Testament well into <laughs> right. the New. Right. But there are human beings on page one. Yep. And there are human beings on the last page. And in fact, on the last pages of the Bible, you don't have Christians anymore. You don't need that designation to pick out the people who are following Christ from those who aren't, because at the end of the Bible, there are only those left who are following Christ. So the term Christian is really a kind of temporary designation. Mm-hmm. And that, that got me thinking, well, well, then what's a human being for? What are we supposed to do? And then how does that fit in with my Christian identity and character? And that's what the book is about. It's essentially trying to talk about what it means to be human and what it means to be Christian and what relationship those two things have. Yeah, part of that, um, I noticed in your first part of the book, you talk about, I believe it's it's Richard Niebuhr's typology. Uh, you mm-hmm. talk about uh, different things, and, and, and Niebuhr, and, and he has different typologies. What bearing do those typologies have on the Christian when it comes to Christian, uh, being not only a Christian and, and being a human as well? Well, Niebuhr's work 50 years ago was a pioneering attempt to try to understand the different ways in which Christians might relate to the broader culture. So it's what's called a typology. It's just Mm -hmm. five theoretically distinct ways of relating to culture. And if we get those five types clear, then we can look at how we are relating to culture and maybe look at how we ought to be relating to culture. So his five-fold typology works like this. At, at one end of the extreme, there's what he called Christ against culture. Mm-hmm. The idea that there's Jesus and everything he stands for, and then there's contemporary culture and everything it stands for, and the two are basically in opposition to each other. Right. At the other end of the extreme would be something like uh, Christ 
of culture, mm -hmm. where the culture and Christ agree on everything. And in between those polar opposites of complete disagreement or complete agreement are three intermediate positions. One of them he calls Christ above culture, where Christ and the Christian church are, relate to culture as a kind of fulfillment, a kind of uh, adding on to what's already there that's good. One called Christ transforming culture, which is the sense that Christ comes to a culture, finds that it badly needs redemption and change, and calls the Christian okay. church to work with him to basically take it over and, right. and re remake it. And in between those two positions is a position that Richard Niebuhr didn't understand very well, even though it was the position of his brother Reinhold, yep. a position he called Christ in paradox with culture. But in this case, he really didn't understand the paradox. He didn't understand how Christians could consistently both follow the way of Christ and follow the way of culture as God had ordained cultural institutions like the government or educational systems or healthcare systems. So Richard Niebuhr went, I think, to his grave, not really understand how you could work in that particular spot. And nowadays, it seems to me, Robbie, when you encounter a, a serious Christian speaker, author, who's calling us to relate properly, Christianly, to culture, he or she will usually pick one of two positions. Now, in certain parts of where you live and where I've lived, you can get the Christ against culture. You know, the world's all bad, and, and yep. we should basically stay away from it, be separate, you know, come out from among them, and so on. Yep. And you can also, in the South, uh, where I have lived a little bit myself, in the southern U.S., um, you can get a Christ of culture, mm. um, where basically um, being a Southern Baptist and being a good Texan or a good Tennessean, uh, pretty much the same thing. Absolutely. I, mean, uh, I remember, I remember uh, going to church with my folks in uh, First Church, Abilene, Texas, and uh, oh, wow. then we'd go see all the same people at the country club yep. afterward. I mean, Absolutely. It was, it was just seamless. But when you hear speakers and authors challenging us today, they usually pick one of the other models, and one of them they'll pick is a version of Christ against culture that's just a little more engaged, but it's still pretty worried about our being engaged in anything that involves what looks like moral compromise. In particular, this is the position of thinkers like John Howard Yoder mm -hmm. and uh, Stanley Hauerwas down at Duke University, mm -hmm. who talk about the worry they have of Christians being implicated in violence or oppression. And so anything that involves us being engaged in something bad like that, we must stay away from. Right. Which pretty much means you can't be a police officer, you can't be a judge, you can't be a politician. At the other extreme are people from a variety of backgrounds, some of them Roman Catholic, some of them Reformed, uh, who basically say, no, 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 the, 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 the call of Christ is to be Lord over everything. So we should do everything we can to take everything over for Jesus and make America Christian again or make Canada Christian again. <laughs> um, and I, I think both of those visions, which I have, have shared sure. uh, at one time or another in my life, because I'm extremely old, so <laughs> I've had a chance to inhabit a lot of different mental worlds. <laughs> but I've, I've enjoyed living in both of those worlds, but also found them to be Inadequate, And what I try to do in this book is to set out what I think is a more realistic and yet hopeful way of being in the world that lets us fully engage in every part of culture, including police work and military work, political work, but at the same time, not expecting to bring in the kingdom of God anytime soon. Right. Absolutely. Um, speaking of, of the brother of, of Richard, uh, neighbor, we're talking about uh, Christian realism. Now, we'll talk about... What, what you talk about is new realism. We'll talk about that here later. Uh, but but kind of just break it down. What is what is Reinhold Niebuhr's idea when you when you talk about Christian realism? Explain mm -hmm. that to us. Reinhold Niebuhr was an American theologian that uh, flourished in the middle of the last century, uh, especially 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And Niebuhr uh, was raised in a liberal Christian tradition and found that it was naive about the way the world worked, that liberal Christianity, as he understood it and as he was taught it, uh, tended to think that if we could just vote the right people into office and if we could just take over the educational systems and if we could just teach people how to live properly, people would. And, of course, after World War I and World War II and the rise of communism internationally and uh, this, this 20th century 
set of horrors where all sorts of social experiments were meant to straighten everybody out and provide the right structure. Everybody would be a good person and people weren't being good people. Uh, Niebuhr took original sin and the fact of sin much more seriously. And so he said, we need to be realistic about the limitations of human beings under the grip of sin. And even when we're not under the grip of sin, I mean, human beings are not God. And so we need to be realistic about our built-in human limitations and realistic also about our limitations and evil uh, following the fall and then work out an ethics in the light of that. And I accept that premise of Niebuhr, but not being a liberal Christian myself, I think the Bible actually has even more to say about what realism means and how we can practice it appropriately today. That's super. That's super. Uh, I think maybe I might be missing it, but I think your general thesis based on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you said, and you go over it over again in your book, you said, who are we for Jesus Christ today? Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? Is that kind of your central thesis in, in question that kind of drives you through the book? Yeah, it is. Um, Bonhoeffer, of course, is widely known for the, the other version, the primary version of that, who is right. Jesus Christ for us today. Right. He tries to recover that so that he can answer the second question. He just yep. never quite poses it, but right. I think it's implicit in what sure. he's doing. A lot of us have discovered the author Dietrich Bonhoeffer through his more popular works, Discipleship, or mm -hmm. The Cost of Discipleship, as it's titled in English. Um, the German is just Nachfolge, it's just Discipleship. Mm -hmm or his book, Life Together. And those are really helpful books in some ways, are truly inspiring. But they still strike me as a kind of young man's book, a little bit naive. And I think Bonhoeffer, as he continued to live under the increasing pressures and distortions of Nazi Germany, uh, began to think differently toward the end of his still relatively short life. Mm -hmm. Bonhoeffer, I think asks us to consider who is Jesus Christ for us today. Now, mm -hmm. that's another way of saying who is Jesus Christ here now yep. for us today. And Bonhoeffer puts the focus of theological and ethical reflection on our present immediate circumstances and challenges. He's not all that interested in formulating an ethics for everybody everywhere. He really believes instead that Jesus is our Lord and leads us as Lord in our present circumstances. And in fact, doesn't just inspire us from a distance like a kind of ancient hero, mm -hmm. but actually is present in his church through the Holy Spirit to lead us right now to know what we're supposed to do in the topsy-turvy circumstances of our lives. Now, in his case, so topsy-turvy that he believed that Ultimately, he should participate in a plot yep. to murder the head of state, yep. to assassinate uh, the Chancellor of Germany. Now, that's really topsy-turvy when a Lutheran <laughs> pastor feels that that's what right. he's supposed to do. Right. Um, but he believed that Jesus was calling them to do that in that extremely horrible situation when the governor, who's supposed to be an instrument of God to preserve order and to let people flourish – is in fact exactly the opposite. He, he's a tool of, of the devil to annihilate uh, millions of people mm -hmm. and to put other millions of people in a state of war. And in that case, uh, Bonhoeffer says, the right thing to do is to follow Jesus even to doing something that is objectively bad. Sure. Uh, assassination is objectively bad, but it's still the right thing to do. And that question then intrigued me to think, well, I don't live in Hitler's Germany, but I still live in a pretty screwed up civilization. Yep. How am I supposed to think about that? Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. Um, in another chapter, you talk about mission. And uh, in that chapter, you talk about uh, placing our ourselves in in the story. Um, what do you mean by that when you talk about placing ourselves in the story and using Scripture not as a means to confine us, but as a means to inspire us, and then that places us into a sort of direction of, of mission living there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we need to appreciate that the Bible uh, not only is written over a period of centuries as the people of God uh, move from being a, a primitive tribe in the Middle East to becoming a, a civilization of some local importance, 
and then the people of God morph into the Christian church in the New Testament um, and point forward uh, from there to our own day. But the Bible itself tells a long story. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then this really good world uh, fell. Right. And we now live in a good world that's endured a bad fall. So in some ways, it looks like its former good self. In some ways, it shows the marks of its injury. And most of the Bible then slows down. I mean, creation only takes two chapters. Right. Um, it gets to tell the story twice in two chapters. <laughs> right. And then we immediately encounter the fall in chapter three, and then there's only about a chapter on that. And then <laughs> most of the rest of the Bible is about this, inter- this, this third stage of redemption, this mm-hmm. long process of God dealing with his people and the rest of the world through his people to try to rehabilitate us, to try to show us our desperate need of change, to then change us. And then the last few chapters of the Bible talk about how God brings that process of redemption or change or rehabilitation Mm -hmm. to a dramatic conclusion, after which the Bible then points forward to a whole new book that, you know, has has yet to be written, so to speak, a whole new part of human human life. If we mistake where we are in the story, we will then make mistakes in our Bible reading and therefore in our living. Christians of some sorts today uh, love the Old Testament, all of us should, but they tend to inhabit the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. and they'll read uh, promises out of the Old Testament and apply them to Christians today without thinking about whether that really makes sense. Um, they'll they'll treat uh, America as if it's the same as ancient Israel. Right. Uh, actually, some Canadians have that habit too, but mostly it's it's an American thing right. the way it used to be a British thing. Yep. Um, others will take uh, some of the more extreme punishments of the Old Testament law and suggest that those be part of uh, North American uh, criminal and civil law today. Mm-hmm. They're forgetting that we're not ancient Israel and we're not inhabiting a promised land. Um, we're, we're in a very different situation today. If we, just to use one more example, the, rehearsing the whole chapter, if, if we think that we should just inhabit the Gospels as if we're still tramping around behind Jesus in Galilee and we ask each other whenever we have an ethical problem, you know, what would Jesus do? Right. Well, that's really not the right question because, yeah. you know, Jesus is dead and gone. Now right. he's risen again and he's Lord of the world, but Jesus had his own particular ministry to fulfill and he fulfilled it admirably and we're not supposed to fulfill that ministry directly. There's only one Son of God who's the Messiah for the world, you know. I'm not Jesus. So asking what would Jesus do is only sort of kind of right. What I need to do is ask what my Lord Jesus wants me mm-hmm. to do here and now. Yep. Who am I to be for Jesus Christ today? And that means locating myself properly downstream of the work of Jesus, downstream of Pentecost in the book of Acts, downstream of hundreds of years of Christian and other civilization to understand what God wants me to do here in Vancouver or God wants me to do in in Springfield or wherever Mm -hmm. we have to be. And that's what the rest of my book is trying to get at, helping us think that way. But, you know, that what would Jesus have me to do? I mean, that's. That's, that wouldn't fit well in those bracelets, though, would it, Dr. Stackhouse? I mean, you couldn't. Well, you could make quite a bit of money because there's more beads that way. You know, <laughs> W, W, G, J, you know, it goes about eight or nine right. beads. There's just four. So there's a real marketing opportunity for you there, Robert. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> what, about, um, what about vocation? You talk about uh, a slothful, or at least maybe I, I'm reading it, but I think you mentioned a slothful ethic. And then you talk about us moving more towards. Uh, the idea of shalom. What does what is vocation? What does it entail for the Christian? Well, God calls human beings in Genesis chapter one and commands them. He says, "This is what I want you to do. I want you to um, fill the earth and subdue it." In fact, yeah. it's it's fascinating that that the very first commandment God gives us is not to worship God. Yeah. In the Bible, the very first commandment is not even to love our neighbors. I think those, those are implied, but in fact, you know, if we're going to be careful Bible readers, the first command that God actually gives us is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm-hmm. You know, have sex, have a lot of sex, have a lot of kids, you know, fill the earth. Now, why would God say that? Because the earth is very good at the end of Genesis 1, but it is not yet cultivated. It is wild. It's not perfect. It's mm-hmm. not perfect in the Hebrew sense or the Greek sense, the languages of the Bible, it's not mature. So while it's very good, it's still unformed in some ways. God leaves it purposely wild 
and calls us to be the image of God, sure. the resemblers of God. And what's God been doing in Genesis? He's been creating things. Yep. So if we're resembling him, we're supposed to get busy, not just laying back and enjoying the paradise that God's given us, but to get off our lawn chairs and get busy cultivating the world. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what God calls human beings generically to do. And he calls all of us Christians to do that all the time, since we don't stop being human beings just when we become Christians. It's not as if all our human work falls apart and we're now supposed to do Christian work all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't go out to my Christian lawnmower and put in Christian gas so I can mow my Christian lawn. <laughs> right. You know, I, I, that, that's a human work. Yeah. I go and get my human lawnmower, my human gasoline, and, and mow the lawn that I have as a human being. So that's very important because I grew up in a tradition that said almost nothing about lawn mowing or <laughs> business or art or sports. It only had to do with trying to evangelize people mm. and keeping your nose clean. So, you know, mm -hmm. be holy. Uh, you know, don't sin and try to get Jesus into every conversation you can, mm. even conversations Jesus doesn't really want much part of. You know, drag him in anyway. Yep. Try to, and we even had pretty, you know, cool little techniques to, uh, to supposedly, to uh, <laughs> bring every conversation around to Jesus, yep. which is why none of us had any friends. Yep. You know, because we were just constantly, uh, <laughs> these religious nuts, dragging yep. Jesus into conversations about, you know, basketball or something. So what I think... I'm trying to sit out here is that God calls us fundamentally to make shalom, yep. to make the world even better than we find it. That's what we do all the time. And then he calls Christians to participate in the special work of calling people to discipleship to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We are Christians. We are people who follow Christ. But again, the reason that we are called by God to bring people to Jesus is not so that there will be a really, really big religion called Christianity. God doesn't care about that. He, he, Christianity is a means to an end. God's not trying to run the biggest, coolest club in the world. He's trying to get the whole world back. And Christians are, like ancient Israel, simply the means by which sure. God is trying to call all human beings back to becoming good human beings. Mm -hmm. So Jesus calls people to himself so that he can call them to the Father. Yep. to get us all reconciled with God the way we were when we started out in the garden. Now, that really helped me to think that way, to think, oh, okay, so God cares about me playing sports well, and he cares about me making art well, and he mm -hmm. cares about me looking after my, my girlfriend or my eventually my wife and my kids. He cares about all that human stuff. In fact, he's commanded me to be creative and persistent in that work, and he also gives me the special dignity as a Christian to say, and I also want you, whenever you get the chance, I want you to make disciples. I want you to call people to become the best followers of Jesus they'll be so that they'll become the best human beings they'll be. Mm. And it looks like then two different identities, human being versus Christian, and two different kinds of work, making shalom, making disciples, ultimately comes together to be the Christian and human task of maximizing shalom. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is where those things wonderfully come together so that my life isn't lived in two categories. Sometimes I'm a human being, sometimes I'm a Christian, yep. but I'm in two different modes depending on the need at the moment. Absolutely. So that's, that's super. And that, that helps me as a Christian, you know, not to compart you know, compartmentalize or it helps me to to gain meaning in my vocation. So many times I... Uh, I talk to parents or people who are like, why am I doing what I'm doing? It's like, well, God has called you to do, you know, whether to be a firefighter, what, like you said, to be a painter or whatever. And that gives you meaning and, and a purpose in your vocation. So that's, that, that's, that's right. And vocation isn't, of course, it is our jobs. And as yeah. you, you know, it's, 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 it's all of what I am, right? Yep. So I'm Absolutely. supposed to be a professor and I'm supposed to be a husband and I'm supposed right. to be a father and a friend and, and those various parts of the life. And that, that's exciting too, isn't it? Because yep. I'm, and it's also a little daunting, Rob, because I'm I'm a pretty good professor, but I'm not that great a dad. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm even worse as a husband. Yeah, and absolutely. So too. it's a little daunting to realize God's calling me to be good at all that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super. Uh, getting on to the last bit of our our talk, um, talk about uh, we, we've already talked about Niebuhr's realism. Talk about what you call new realism, your principles of new realism, um, and, and what do you mean by that? 
Well, I think that, that where Reinhold Niebuhr was let down by his training was that he just didn't take the Bible as authoritatively uh, as, as conservative or orthodox Christians uh, do. Right. So there's just more richness there. Um, I think that we really can benefit from the Old Testament as more realistic in its depiction of things and, and as more accurate in its depiction of things than Niebuhr was prepared to, uh, to, to take. Niebuhr had, for instance, um, very little to say about the spiritual side of life. Mm. He was so concerned about the social and political side of life right. that he didn't have much to say about, about sin and redemption as a spiritual matter, and particularly a personal matter either. He had trouble focusing on individuals. Yep. He's one of those guys who always talks about forests, <laughs> but doesn't talk much about individual trees. Right. Uh, whereas in my book, I talk about C.S. Lewis, who yep. was almost the opposite. He yep. was very keen on talking yep. As, as an individual person to another individual person. That's part of why his books are so charming, is mm. that you have the feeling you've got this brilliant uncle who's talking to you by the fireplace. Right. Um, but he had almost nothing helpful to say about large-scale social matters, and mm. Reinhold's much better for that. Yeah. Um, so I've enjoyed both of them, and I think Bonhoeffer actually strikes a better balance than either of the two. Sure. So I'm trying to do the same thing, and just yeah. trying to ransack the Bible and Christian tradition all I can, for all the help I can get sure. in figuring out what it means to live for Jesus and to be a responsible human being in a world where there is frequently um, not an obvious answer as to what to do, sure. and to try to trust Jesus to help me figure out what that is going to be in a particular situation. Yep, and it's it's not always black and white, is it? It's it's. Uh, well, that's what I found, and and I think Bonhoeffer's case, you know, of 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 assassinate, trying to assassinate Hitler, is is, is a good example of that. <laughs> but I teach at an international graduate school here, Robbie, as you know, yep. where we have students from over forty countries of the world, and Whew. one of my favorite students, um, who is a Chinese woman from uh, the Philippines. Wow. She was raised there and family has, does business there. She came to Canada for her business degree, went back and worked in marketing for a while, then came back to reach and earned a couple of theological degrees. And, and she's now uh, working in the church, but also uh, working with other uh, professionals in business. And one of the things Elaine had to teach me about is that if you want to do business in the Philippines, you better be prepared to bribe people. Mm. And that was just shocking to right. me because Christians don't bribe people. Exactly. And, well, then that's fine. But then Christians aren't going to run any businesses either. And, and virtually nowhere in Africa, I'm told, can you get anything done if you're not prepared to bribe that's officials. True. That's true. So this, this taking realistically the way the world works is something my ethical training gave me no preparation for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to talk about being raised in privileged, white, middle North America um, where you can trust the police most of the time and you can trust the government at least most of the time and you yep. you know things are pretty good for us but most people through history and most people in the world today deal with corrupt openly corrupt governments with sure. with police officers who are more often than not going to beat you up if you don't pay them off yep. and what are you going to do when you live in these situations and i think frankly in my book i don't take that as seriously as i have even done in a couple of years since then mm -hmm. i think when i talk about the normal versus the borderline, mm -hmm. the, the situation of ethical complexity and, and difficulty. Uh, I've since, as I talk about it through, uh, with, it, with some of my students here, I realize that for some people, the borderline is the normal. Mm -hmm. You know, they're living in a, a, a bad culture all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they're going to have to cope with that, making sure. the best of it. If you're in North Korea, you got a tough situation to make the best yes, of it. You if you live in China, it's a pretty tough situation yep. to make the best of it. You're going to have to deceive certain officials. You're going to have to lie low, and you're going to have to do what the apostles did and obey God rather than men. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to get toward uh, in, in part of that book, too. So final, final question. How do we, um, and I guess in, in, in my context, like you said, the, the North American white middle class, um, but, but even in, in our context, you know, in, in America, North America, in general, how do we practically just, like you said, make the best of it? How do we pass it on to the next generation? How do we, mm. how do we talk about uh, principles of shalom and, and, and not coming up with a slothful ethic, but coming up with an ethic that's, that's biblical and, and also um, creative, you mm. know, and, and culturally savvy, you know what I mean? And, and, yep. and how do we do that? Well, I think one of the things we realize is that there isn't uh, an easy answer. 
Right. I have tried to make things as simple as possible, and I do think that what I'm suggesting boils down to the title of the book, Making the Best of It. Yep. I do think it boils down to a slogan like Maximize Shalom. <laughs> yeah. But to understand what it means to make the best of a particular situation, to understand what it means to maximize shalom in a difficult family situation. You know, how do I maximize shalom when my parents are fighting with each other all sure. the time? How do I maximize shalom when my coach is encouraging me to, uh, to dirty tricks on sure. the playing field? Or uh, how, do I, how do I make the best of it when my boyfriend's pressuring me to have sex? And I really love him, but I'm not really sure I want to when we're not married yet. Um, for each of these situations, there isn't something you can just look up in the Bible, uh, for a lot of them at least, and nor can you just look it up in a little pamphlet. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote a big book is that it's complicated. Yep. And since most of us don't have the opportunity to read great big books of ethics, let alone go to graduate school, mm -hmm. we have each other. Yep. And we have our teachers. And the challenge for regular Christians, I think, practically, is to make sure that you're not making decisions only by yourself. Yep. That you think through ethical challenges in the company of other friends who get it, and they can help you from their perspective, but also from teachers, from wise older people. Now, those older people don't have to have PhD after their names or don't have to have reverend in front of their names, but they should be mature people who you can try out your ideas on, try your perspective on. It might be your parents, it might be a, a youth worker like yourself. Sure. It might be an author that we read. But I think the real danger in our highly individualistic society is that you'll hear an interview like this and you'll say, oh, well, then great. Well, then I'll just kind of do whatever I think I should do. <laughs> That'll make Jesus happy. Well, that's right. not seriously trying to find out what Jesus right. wants in a right. situation. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, hold on, Dr. Stackhouse. I appreciate you so much. This is Youth Ministry 6.3, another episode uh, with Dr. Stackhouse making the best of it, his book that I believe was published back in 2008, I believe, maybe 2009, somewhere around there. Yeah, um, 2008, but just out in paperback this week. Well, there we go. There we go. So, so you had a timely interview, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stackhouse. I appreciate you so much. Great to talk to you.